I just want to say that those grannies were raging. And, uh, if we can just give them one more round of applause. Today I would like to introduce one of the earliest voices in environmental justice, Norris McDonald. In 1979, Norris was hired as a staffer at the Environmental Policy Institute, now called Friends of Earth. Here, he worked for the following seven years and was introduced to environmental issues across the nation. During his tenure at the Environmental Policy Institute, Norris noticed the absence of black professionals in the environmental groups across Washington, D.C. This led Norris to create the African American Environmental Association, an organization dedicated to protecting the environment, enhancing animal, human, and plant ecologies, and increasing African American participation in the environmental movement. Norris led this new organization in what would later be known as urban environmentalism, promoting recycling, cleaning storm drains, weatherizing and climate auditing homes, and working class neighborhoods across Washington, D.C. In 1989, the African American Environmental Association began placing black college students into internship positions with several national organization, environmental groups. Many of these internships manifested into permanent positions with national environmental organizations and agencies such as the EPA. The African American Environmental Association has also sponsored creek walks, tours of inner city toxic waste sites, power plants, drinking water plants, sewage treatment plants, and conservation farms, all with the idea of bringing together mostly white environmentalists with the black inner city residents. Norris participated in the, in the initial meetings with the EPA to advocate for the adoption of environmental justice policies. Because of his work, Norris has been recognized with various awards, including the Environment Magazine Award, the Conservation Award from the National Wildlife Federation, and the Green Room Energy and Environmental Leadership Award. Norris has been recognized by Ebony Magazine as one of the top 100 most influential African Americans, and recently recognized by New York City for his selfless service to the environment. Norris continues to advocate for environmental justice and technology-based solutions to curb our current climate crisis. What I've just covered is only a microscopic portion of Norris's prolific accomplishments. He has participated in numerous federal, state, and local advisory committees, served as director of the Energy Conservation and Transportation Project for the Environmental Policy Institute, and organized a Congressional Energy Brain Trust. It is an honor to introduce Norris McDonald. Thank you, Sean. Um, and I'm delighted to be here in Eugene, Oregon today. Um, as you mentioned, my name is Norris McDonald. I'm the founder and president of the African American Environmental Association. The last time I was here, it was 27 years ago. Right here at the University of Oregon at the law school, giving a keynote. And I was terrified. I was terrified because I had just in that year, or the, the previous year, gone into a respiratory failure in an ambulance on the way to the hospital. Uh, asthma attack. And so, it was scary flying out here to Oregon because uh, I was afraid I was going to have an asthma attack on an airplane. The last thing I wanted to do was get on a big metal tube at 30,000 feet. And I didn't know about nebulizers at that time. Anyway, I was afraid of having an asthma attack flying out here. I was terrified as I was giving my presentation out here 27 years ago. Um, so it's been a long time, and then three years later I had another asthma attack and went into respiratory failure. So I was intubated both of those times for four days each time. You know intubation, where they put the tube down your throat and breathe for you. So I went through that. And so I take care of these issues pretty seriously. That first asthma attack was caused by smog. Uh, my car had broken down, so I was taking mass transit, and I was standing out on a thoroughfare, breathing in the smog, I'm sure, during the day, and by that evening, my um, lungs had shut down, and so uh, went into respiratory failure. So anyway, I take air pollution issues pretty seriously. I was already doing it from a policy standpoint. But from a personal standpoint, um, it really brought the issue home. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Sean introduced my background. I've got a pretty wide background, everything from creek walks, as he said, to heavy-duty industrial um, um, participation. But I want to leave something with you at the beginning of my talk here. I'm going to go about maybe 15 minutes. I'm going to try not to bore you. And then try to leave it open for questions. We have a number of people here, and maybe we can have a good back and forth. 
I hope I have some thought-provoking things to share with you here this afternoon. Um, the thing I want to start out with, like I said, I'm going to start out with it, and I'm doing that because I want you to think about it. And I'm going to come back to it at the end of my presentation here, um, because I want you to chew on it for a while. Blacks do not own any energy infrastructure or resources in the United States. No coal mines, no pipelines, no cargo ships, no tankers. None of the energy resources or infrastructure in the United States. Virtually. And there's a couple of little examples people might come up with, but virtually that's going on. And we probably all know the history of why that probably is. So the, the particular thing, I want you to think about that in general, but the particular thing I want you to think about is um, should, um, should blacks own a coal mine? Should blacks own a coal mine in a global warming world? I'll come back to that at the end. Please think about it. Think about what I said about the energy resources and, and infrastructure and then the coal mine issue. And we can talk about it at the end. Um, African American Environmentalist Association. Some people are taken aback by that name. Is that some kind of separatist national sort of group? No. In virtually every city in the United States, there's a black side of town and there's a white side of town. Virtually every city. Black side of town usually on the southern end, down in the polluted areas. So that leads to some unique geographical and sociological issues. In many cases, as you are all aware of now with environmental justice, it leads to a, there's a disproportionate number of pollution sites in the minority communities. Everybody's pretty much aware of that now, they pretty much accept that. And if you go in and look at it from a GIS standpoint or any other standpoint, and I've said this pretty extensively, you'll see that there's a disproportionate number of pollution sites in these uh, minority communities. So from that perspective, the African American Environmentalist Association makes sense because we go in there directly without any distractions, without any intimidation to address the issues very specifically. Because it's not as though environmental and energy issues aren't complex enough. Air issues alone, it's not as if they're not complex enough. Let's also put racial issues in there as well. Let's throw race in and make it even more complex. Regardless, when I think of children having asthma attacks, that's the motivator. That's the motivator to go out and try to really get up, get, make a difference from the, from the clean air standpoint. I'm a creature of Washington, D.C. I came up through the national environmental movement in Washington, D.C. I'm an inside the Beltway guy, basically, a policy wonk. And so the first thing I noticed at the national environmental level, and this was in 1979, 1980, was that there weren't any black professionals working for the groups. And so I said, well, if I ever go off on my own, I would form an organization that would very specifically address these environmental issues. And some of the policies that the national groups were pushing, I found, were anathema to the interests of um, the black community, frankly, um, such as using price as a conservation tool. I directed the Energy Conservation Project for what's now Friends of the Earth then, and um, worked to protect the weatherization program. Once I formed the African American Environmentalist Association, we actually went out and weatherized homes. All I had to weatherize hundreds of homes. So I know that very intimately and very um, specifically. So we, we get the green jobs thing on the ground, and it's that's tough work. It's tough to raise a family with um, with a green job. I did it. I tried to do it. I had family at the time and with asthma. And so we've done that. Well, what, what's happening now, though, the, the hot topic right now is the Green New Deal. The Green New Deal is a new hot topic. And I assume that many people probably in the room support um, the Green New Deal. <laughs> and, and just so long as the Green New Deal works and works effectively and efficiently, I'll support it, whatever works. What frustrates me as an Inside the Beltway Washington guy is that I've seen the um, um, ends, ups and downs of, of air policy. When the Democrats are in, we get um, a lot of regulations. We, we get um, new source review. We get all these regulations. Then the Republicans come in, and they cut them back. And the Democrats come in, and they cut them, and they put them back in. And so you never really get the reductions that we would like. The state implementation program, the SIP program, SIP. In the SIP program, it's the state program that's supposed to protect us from air um, um, issues. The penalties under the state implementation plan are if you're in violation of the Clean Air Act, 
in every single metropolitan area in the United States is in violation of the Clean Air Act for ozone. If you're in violation of the Clean Air Act, the penalty is supposed to be you're not supposed to get new building permits or you're not supposed to get transportation funds. So if, um, for instance, this area was in vi violation um, of the county, the state, you wouldn't be able to build a new stadium out there, but it's rarely enforced. And so from a regulatory standpoint, and being a Washington inside of Beltway Walk, it was frustrating to me to see the regulations really weren't working because every single metropolitan area is still in violation of the Clean Air Act for ozone. Frustrating. Very frustrating for me. So what works? The Green New Deal can get us in compliance of um, Clean Air Act. I'm all for it. Let's do it. And let's do it right away. Um, because you'll see on the ground, that's what put me in the hospital and almost killed me twice. Well, at least one of those times is uh, ozone pollution. So, so what works? What works in the United States? We are a dynamic society. I'm glad I live my life here in the United States. Just dynamic. I, I, was, I lived in the suburbs. I kind of hate the suburbs. Kind of sterile. But I love America, but we're a dynamic society, and we demand a lot of energy. We use 18 million barrels of oil every single day in this country. Basically, to drive into work and to drive home. 18 million barrels of oil every single day. Right now, from our electricity standpoint, you know, um, coal is still at about 33% to produce our electricity. Natural gas is, I think, at about 33%. Nuclear is coming in at 20. And renewables, including hydro, and many of you, I'm sure, know these stats, are around that 9, 10% um, area. So in America, we're using up all of the above. Now, I think with the Green New Deal, they're talking about backing out fossil fuels. Well, we're a practical environmental group, and, I, you know, frankly, I don't see that happen in this country. And um, I, will, I will oppose using fossil fuels with everybody else when everybody else stopped using fossil fuels. The reason we use 33% of the energy from coal and 33% from natural gas is because you demand that electricity right now everywhere. You demand it everywhere right now all the time. And the utility company is going to provide it. And the utility company doesn't really care. They don't care whether it's delivered by photovoltaics or hydro. They want to be able to deliver that service to you safely and dependably and, and, make, and make a profit off of it to the extent that they can. People think there's some big conspiracy where they're against solar and they're against wind. They're probably, and I've worked with a number of utility companies, they're pretty much for whatever works very well. And so am I, like I said, if it works well, let's use it. What's working well now evidently in the United States, because that's what we're using, is all of the above. We're using all of the above. And as I said before, the Green New Deal wants to back out fossil fuels. Okay, well you need a practical way to back out that 18 million barrels of oil every single day to drive into work and drive home. People say electric vehicles, it's a long way to get to um, electric vehicles replacing, uh, you know, ugh. 100 million automobiles and 100 million vehicles. It's a long way to get there. So from an environmental justice standpoint, what are we looking at here? Everybody in the room pretty much knows what environmental justice is now. It's the equal treatment of people regarding environmental issues. Environmental injustice is the unequal treatment of people regarding environmental issues. And so when it comes within the context of an all of the above energy strategy, and that's what America is operating on right now, how does that work? How does that work in protecting vulnerable communities? Well, what we have done as the African American Environmental Association is we have pushed for legislation to solve it, to try to help solve that problem. And that has included drafting environmental justice acts. We drafted an environmental justice act 10 years ago to try to get it introduced, but that's almost an impossible climb in Congress to get a National Environmental Justice Act passed. A National Environmental Justice Act that would have teeth by teeth, I mean a, an act that would stop a project. Right now we have NEPA, National Environmental Policy Act, but that can't stop a project. Only thing you can do with that is maybe delay it because they messed up on some process issue. But it, it, it doesn't have teeth anywhere to stop an issue. A National Environmental Justice Act, would, from my perspective, of what we have written up, and it's on our website if you want to go look at it, would evaluate areas and if there's a disproportionate impact, it would have teeth in it where you couldn't put another project in there. You just couldn't put another project, frankly, on the black side of that because it's already overly polluted. 
And so it's impossible almost to get that passed at a national level. Senator Cory Booker has introduced uh, legislation to do that, and I commend him for that. I drafted um, the, the Environmental Act for New York City, and we got that passed, and it was signed by Mayor de Blasio in 2017. It took us 14 years to get it passed. Got introduced um, uh, by the city council, and it sat there, and people fought it. It still doesn't have the teeth in it that I was talking about. You still don't get teeth. You get, you know, you get advisory groups and working groups, and so you get around the edges, but you don't get a solution, something with teeth in it that will stop a project. But that's better than nothing. It's better than what they have now. There aren't any state environmental justice laws with teeth in it like that either, and so we are standing trying to get in, uh, state environmental justice uh, laws passed. So hopefully that can happen. Um, and we hope that can happen real soon. The environmental justice acts are important. New York liked my work so much they gave me a proclamation work, uh, recognizing my environmental work last November. And uh, that was a lot of fun. Uh, the city council uh, gave that out. And that was uh, a lot of fun. Let me uh, thank you. So that was a lot of fun. So, Green New Deal has been a great, in my opinion, public relations campaign. It has brought the issue back on the front burner. Everybody's talking energy and environment right now, so um, Ocasio-Cortez has done a great job in getting that issue really back up on the front burner. You've gotten people agitated. Have, they have them talking about it. And, I, you know, there's probably some pretty impractical things in there, too, but it's probably to get everybody worked up. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. In Washington, you need to get people worked up. Um, we get people worked up. Um, we're in a pro-nuclear environmental group. I know that's going to make many people in here angry, especially the guy out front handing out the flyer. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I went through the epiphany to go pro-nuclear, trust me, uh, because... Anyway, there was an epiphany because uh, nuclear plants don't emit greenhouse gases or smart form gases. No greenhouse gas, no smog forming gas. I know they, they're the big boogeyman, they might blow up a few uh, radiation everywhere. But that hasn't happened in the United States. Um, so, from an environmental justice standpoint, the plants usually aren't in black communities. Frankly, they're in white communities. But since they don't, um, <coughs> since they don't contribute to smog, they're actually helpful for the minority communities. And to the extent the plants close down, they're replaced with fossil fuel plants, usually in minority communities. So the position we have pushed is, unless you can find another way to replace that power um, with an emission-free source, then the nuclear plants, um, the nuclear plants are a good thing. Let me though go deeper than that. The Green New Deal is an interesting plan, but I think we have a better plan, and it includes kind of all of the above. I'm going to go over that real quickly, and I'm going to try to wrap wrap up so we can get to some questions. I know you want. Probably get after me about this nuclear stuff. <laughs> um, we have a program that we're pushing called Energy Defense Reservations. Energy Defense Reservations. And what Energy Defense Reservations would do is basically take a coal plant and take the carbon dioxide coming out of that coal plant and convert it into a diesel fuel. Now, the way that would work is you would need a coal plant that burns its coal in um, almost pure oxygen, probably 90% oxygen, oxy-combustion, really efficient, so you would get less, fewer emissions. You would still need the scrubbers there to scrub for night knocks and socks, but um, for the carbon dioxide, what you want with that coal plant then is with the oxy-combustion, it's burning a lot more efficiently. Well, then uh, you also need a nuclear plant next to the coal plant. The nuclear plant would split water, through hydrolysis and create hydrogen for our hydrogen economy, for the electric vehicles we need. So you'd have the hydrogen in that process. It would split the oxygen off too. It took the hydrogen off and the oxygen off through hydrolysis or high temperature steam cracking. So you have the hydrogen for the hydrogen economy and the fuel cell, the electric vehicles. You have the oxy oxygen. Um, for the coal plant to burn to then reduce the amount of carbon dioxide it's spitting out. And then what you have is you can convert the carbon dioxide into diesel fuel, as I said. And that's a process you use the Fisher-Tropes process. Hopefully some people in here are familiar with Fisher-Tropes. 
That's what the Germans used in Germany to convert coal into diesel fuel to, 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 to power their war machine. Sassol in South Africa does the same thing right now. I have two of that facility down there. They convert the um, coal into fuel. And so all this does is take the carbon dioxide and converts it into a fuel. Well, um, the Defense Department, recently we call it Energy Defense Preservation, the Defense Department has a lot of money. So the Defense Department, we would hope we tap into some of that money to build the sort of plants we're talking about. This would be a big, these would be big, huge, expensive facilities. Ten of them in ten different regions of the United States. Hopefully combined with a, a national transmission grid that would provide the sort of electricity we need with very minimal emissions coming out of this facility. This energy defense reservation plan, I think, I think it could, it could get bipartisan support. I know people are anti-coal and anti-nuclear, um, anti-fossil fuels, anti-natural gas. But the bottom line right now is what they're talking about in New York. Con Ed and National Grid are talking about a moratorium on, on, on new buildings. Um, you can't get a, a, a connection to a new building because they don't have the gas because all the pipelines are being um, opposed. So there's going to be a moratorium. If um, um, Jeffrey Bezos has gotten Amazon approved in New York, they'd be a problem with what they're built because they can't provide the natural gas they need to do it. That's what's coming down from New York and New England. That's going to be an issue. The fact that you can't build a, a, a pipeline from them. We don't even want to get into the electric transmission lines. You can't get electric transmission lines approved in New York State. So if you oppose everything everywhere, don't expect to get electricity everywhere all the time. And that's what we Americans expect. When we flip that switch, we expect it to happen. As an African American environmentalist group, we have to be very practical. I'm going to try to wrap up here for you, because I know I, I hope I didn't fix your sleep on that environmental energy defense reservation program. But as a, as a minority group that, that, that then has a, a population that doesn't own any of the facilities that produce the pollution, African Americans don't own any plants that spit out fossil fuels. So as that, we need a plan that's going to work for all Americans, but also that will not then continue with the disproportionate pollution being put into African American communities. So it's a double-edged sword. So maybe try to identify with that, and that's why then I put the challenge out about ownership. Should blacks own a coal mine, and I'm just using that as an example, in a global warming world? Should blacks own oil fields, natural gas pipelines, multi-trillion dollar businesses worldwide that black Americans are not, African Americans are not involved in at all? So should you keep blacks, and this to me is an environmental justice issue. Prosperity is an issue. There's a lot of prosperity from people who benefit from the fossil fuel industry in the United States in the 20th century and 21st century. The African American community not only hasn't benefited or, or prospered from the economic part of it, but also get the brunt of most of the pollution. So I go back to the fact or the question, should blacks have ownership in the fossil fuel industry? in a global warming world. It's a two-edged sword. So you see the sort of conflicts our group wrestles with. They're very complex issues to wrestle with and to try to figure out. And that's why we came up with something like the energy defense reservation um, aspect. Um, as I said with nuclear power, um, then you meant have there been any um, deaths from radiation accidents in the United States that are nuclear plant? So, right now, though, the job is trying to convince the nuclear industry to keep running the plants. They want to get out of the business or to build new plants. Forget about that. So now it's a matter of convincing them to stay in the business. It's very easy to do natural gas. Put, put a turbine up, put some gas in it, and run it. I'll end there and take questions. Yes. Yes. It seems like uh, maybe you're proposing that the minority communities take part in shared prosperity of dying industries. Industries that are not only dying, including nuclear, uh, but industries that must die if we're interested in self preservation. So, my question is about whether you're more interested in self-preservation
salvation or prosperity if it comes to a choice. And if you're interested in both, why not own a solar company? From a business standpoint, it's a matter of making profit. It's a matter of capital investment. A solar project is going to be a very risky project for a small business person. To really get bang for the buck, you're going to have to have a really big project. And it's going to cost a lot. And the regulatory um, aspect of that alone is brutal. Most, if not many, of the entrepreneurs, uh, minority entrepreneurs, and I, I deal with a group called the American Association of Blacks in Energy. Those are blacks who work for professional companies, the energy companies. So I try to have a relationship with them. But it's an uphill climb, and it's um, from an from a from a business standpoint, it's it's speculative that you can stay in business. I was the first environmentalist to go out and support the Cape Wind project off the coast of Massachusetts. Biggest protest I saw for and against. 300 people outside and inside for and against. Kennedy was against because it was done. Robert Kennedy Jr. was against because it was going to mess up the view of the ocean in his backyard. Well, I met with the company that was doing that project. And I said, well, how long are you guys going to stick with this? You've been at it for three or four years. How much longer can you do it? And we said, well, we can probably do another two years on this thing. But 15 years later, still not approved. That kills you if you're a developer, an entrepreneur. Just the time kills the project. As environmentalists, we know that's how we kill projects. We'll go out there and do lawsuits and do whatever we need to do to, to delay the project to kill it. So from a straight business standpoint, I don't know that you would recommend going into a speculative area that, frankly, the NIMBYs are going to oppose you on, the environmentalists locally are going to oppose you on, they're going to oppose the wind farm and the photovoltaics, just as they would oppose any other pipe, uh, process, such as the pipeline process or transmission process. That has been the experience out there. Yet, today, we use 18 million barrels of oil just to drive to work and go home. You may call it a dying industry, but I don't. That, that to me, sounds like a real profit area. Or the big boys wouldn't be in there making all that money every day. And go ahead, you can follow up. And yet, as long as that's a healthy industry, our self-preservation is a failed proposition. Did you drive here today? I parked it. The moment people stop using fossil fuels, I will go with your argument. I don't own a car. The moment people stop using fossil fuels, such as we're doing right now, with these lights and this heat, I will agree with you. But that's not a dying industry. That's what we operate on today. And our culture is dying. And our way of life, our, self our ability to, to preserve ourselves is done if we keep those industries healthy. So why would you want to get into an industry that must be stopped if those communities you serve are going to survive? Because you and I use them. When we stop using them, I will um, stop supporting them. If what you say is right, nobody here should be using fossil fuels. If that is your position, do not use fossil fuels and it will go away. We're using more, not less. We're going to use more energy, not less. And so my point is, if, if you're going to use it, should blacks make money off of it as well? Is the planet going to hell in a handbasket from global warming? Yes, it is. But we're still using fossil fuels. Next question. Where? Oh, thank you. Back. Thank you. Uh, so it seems that humanity is collectively no more intelligent than a mold in a petri dish because it's going to consume its resource and then go extinct. And uh, so I'm going to ask you this. Is there ever a crossover point where we stop using uh, hydrocarbons or are we just going to use it all up and raise up the uh, CO2 in the atmosphere to 600? I figure I'm going to make you mad now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're going to use it all up. <laughs> yes. China, India, I went to China. They want everything we have. And why shouldn't they have it? If they get everything we have, you can forget about it. Yes, we're going to use every piece. Unfortunately, there's so much coal out there, we don't know what to do with it. Coal is dirt. It's literally dirt. The Powder River Basin in Montana and Wyoming, there's so much coal there, we don't know what to do with it. It's dirt, and it's going to get used. It's going to get exported to Asia. That's why, frankly, I don't want our planet to die from global warming. That's why we push for innovation, making prosperity through innovation. That's why I came up with the energy defense reservation concept, is to try to do what you're talking about, do something really practical and big, 
and it's going to be expensive. But any solution to global warming is going to be expensive. It's going to be very expensive. But we need a practical um, solution that brings in everybody, that brings in the big oil money, that brings in the coal money, that brings in the natural gas money, that brings in the solar and wind money. Get them all together. Because instead of using nuclear plants, you could also try to use wind and solar to do the same thing you're doing with the nuclear plant to crack the water that I was talking about. So you can also do the renewables route. But to me, the nuclear route is a more, it's base load, so it's a more dependable way because that's a lot of carbon dioxide coming out of the coal plant. Next question? Yes. yes. I don't know. That's like solving the racial situation in America. I don't know how to solve it. 
electricity is going um, supplied to pay to store shopping malls, mm -hmm. which used to be inspired by American way of life. And this is something that we are aspiring. And even if India is posting, India or China are posting, are posting renewables, you know, they, they're posting that we, we're adding several gigawatts of renewables every year. But what I see and I resonate with that because even if we go completely renewable in the future, um, it is the poor and marginalized who are going to face uh, the disproportionate burden of hosting those plants. And not to mention the future renewables in that sense, resources needed to run those batteries. Yeah. Where is it? Where is all the minerals going to come from? Right. And uh, lithium, we don't know. Don't know, don't have enough lithium for 100 million vehicles. Exactly. So this gets me thinking. And then when you mentioned this whole thing about New York and Walmart and, and, and uh, Amazon not having enough power to run, run the new store in New York, mm -hmm. is that the way you want to go? Because I don't think developing countries are really investing in those things. And are we still thinking about degrowth? We want to shrink because we want a future. We want renewables. But renewables never going to fuel lifestyles that we have. Correct. I mean, you cannot have American lifestyles. That's right. Well. I, I truly wish that wind and solar could power our economy. With all my heart and soul, I wish it, they could, but they can't. They cannot be based on sources. The physics aren't there. They can't operate 24-7. Where, where, where? The one in the yellow. Yes, please. Okay, I'll call on her. Thank you. Uh-oh, uh-oh, I'm going to be in trouble. You got recommended. We are trying to keep it the same. Yeah, capitalism, 
Capitalism is capitalism. The quarterly, the quarterly report, the quarterly corporate report is, is, our, is our mantra. Well, it's not a matter of me thinking beyond this matter of getting the companies who invest to do it. Right now, the energy sector, it's in such flux, they don't even know what to do. Except to turn to natural gas because there's so much of it because of fracking and horizontal drilling. That innovation alone kills us in terms of efficiency and wind and solar when you can get gas that cheaply and once they start burning it and once they start exporting it through LNG, you know, um, with Japan closing its nuclear plants, now they have to turn to coal and probably LNG to power their dynamic communities. So it's just tough what you're talking about. Um, and like I said, everybody wants a ton of energy all the time in the back back there. So you're talking about nuclear power and I live up in, in Portland near Hanford and I know there's a lot of issues with the waste and I know that was from nuclear bombs. I know, okay. I'm sure it's different, but there has to be some waste even with nuclear energy. So what sort of, and I don't know anything about it, so what sort of waste is that and how can we deal with it in a way that doesn't pollute an entire region? Put it on the Indian reservations like they've been doing away with. <laughs> Which we don't want, by the way, and we're poor. And uh, we do own some oil and gas, but the contracts are controlled by the federal government. We'd rather you stop doing that and extracting it. And, uh, and they're trying to cheat you out of that. How do you pull the contracts? They're trying to cheat us out of that, and we want you to rather just stay the hell off our land and quit using uh, leaving the waste from, from uh, green and mining on our land, too. Yep. And killing our people. This is environmental injustice, by the way. It is, absolutely. Just as um, the nuclear plants that don't put smog into minority communities and urban areas represents environmental justice for the black community. So it's, it's a two-edged sword. In the back of nuclear waste, uranium can be, um, uranium-235 can be reprocessed. Most of the energy is still in that pellet when they um, take it out to store it now on site. You can reprocess that uranium and reuse it over and over again. I think the best place to do that is actually at Yucca Mountain in Nevada. I've been to Yucca Mountain. I've been in the Five Mile Tunnel. I stood on top of the mountain, and for as far as I could see, you know, no sign of life. Not a tree, not a snake, not a anything. I think that's where we should bury it for retrieval, and also where we should reprocess it for reuse. And we almost have an endless source of power there. I toured the uh, reprocessing facility in France, um, uh, La Havre, and they're already doing it there. So it's doable, it's just not necessarily economic right now. It's easier just to make the fuel virgin and, and use it than to try to use the reprocessing uh, mode. But the waste can be reprocessed and we, can, we have fuel forever. And there are a number of other thorium, there's a thorium economy, there's a number of other ways that Vision can be used properly to power our economy. I think we should do it. Unfortunately, right now, my job is trying to keep the nuclear industry um, in it. When I first went pro-nuclear in 2001, and we were the first environmental group to go pro-nuclear, a plant was projected to cost a billion dollars. Now that plant is projected to cost $10 billion to $15 billion. You're not going to get these companies to do the investment in nuclear plants. You don't have to go oppose them. They're not, they're not going to do it. <laughs> But that doesn't help us from a global warming standpoint. Because from a base load standpoint, you cannot beat them. Absolutely cannot beat them. You may clap, but that's not a good situation. Yes? Well, first of all, I want to thank you for being here. Thank you for having me.
Well, I gave you the energy defense preservation. That, that's our primary one because you have to um, do that. Outside of that, you wouldn't like my solutions because my solutions are practical. My solutions are within the context of the American economy and what America does. <laughs> well, I mean, prosperity. Prosperity is an environmental issue. Everybody wants to be prosperous. Prosperous just like Americans. That is an environmental issue. How does the United States of Africa become prosperous? How does India have suburban homes forever like we have here in retail shops as far as the eye can see? How does China do that? They do that by supplying them with the amount of energy that they need. Now, we need to promote the most effective and environmentally friendly way to do that, like best scrubber technology. You know, you use coal, coal, coal. We can get to the socks and the not, we just can't get to the carbon dioxide. Those are no scrubber for carbon dioxide. We scrub pretty well for mercury, socks, not, and the regulations have been pretty good, except the Republicans and Democrats fighting each other, because now the, um, the scrubber plant costs as much as the actual physical plant costs about a billion dollars, the scrubber system costs about a billion dollars. So that's an industry I would recommend people getting into, providing components for scrubbers for our power plants, um, supplying India, supplying um, China. So, I mean, that would be a solution within the framework for scrubbers. Outside of that, it's also providing the world with the energy they need. There's going to be LNG export from the United States. There just is. Liquefied natural gas. We're going to export it. I know, I know, I know. But somebody's going to burn it. It's not going to stay in the ground. Same thing with coal. America is going to, going to export coal. To the extent that that happens, we can sit back and cry and whine and moan, or we can try to provide the sort of scrubber technology that will at least make it as environmentally friendly as possible. I know, in the real world. Yes, in the back there. I saw somebody back there. Thank you. So, I was curious as far as like, energy. Aren't those companies scaling to the future to meet those demands? Which, which companies? Uh, for renewable energy, like free, like solar, like that kind of renewable energy. I'm sorry, repeat your question, I didn't really hear. Aren't those companies trending towards the scale of meeting the energy needs of the future? <coughs> They're scaling to satisfy their stockholders and their profit, and they're looking at where we're going with that, and where we're going is to natural gas. But if you look at the technology behind the solar panel, uh, panel right? Mm -hmm. Where that was 10 years ago versus 20 years ago, mm -hmm. it has this incremental growth that is just even far, far more efficient. Right? So we keep on investing into those industries. Isn't that a smarter like, objective? Right? Because there's less consequences that come You know, that hopefully it might be, but the constraints for doing that are so high, it's ridiculous. When you say that, it sounds good. But then when you get out there, you have environmentalists and NIMBYs opposing your wind and solar process. These aren't little squirrel's nests in trees, these are huge industrial facilities that have an incredible impact on the local environment, whether it's photovoltaic or wind. 200 wind turbines is a monstrous industrial facility. I don't think you've been to Washington or Oregon. I've been to Texas and I've seen 100 miles of wind turbines. I'm just saying they're huge. They're huge development projects and, and people, my point is that from a corporate standpoint, they're opposed. That's all. These big projects are opposed. But even people's like mentality is Yes, right here. So I, I appreciate the emphasis on black prosperity. Mm -hmm. Because I'm coming from Detroit, which is a black 40% of low income. And that's the question that I get all the time from people that we work with. How can we benefit from that? But here, here's the issue that we run into. So one of the key issues is the way that how it's being pumped. The, the pipeline utility that provides electricity to all the great residents is like an increased rate by about 35%. Wow. And so, with like Detroit being quite almost completely black, mostly building, uh, <coughs> residents are starting to ask, well, how can we own this? And unfortunately, there's no easy answer because that industry requires such a large amount of capital that even if all of the players hold their resources mm -hmm. together to try to create their own electric utility, mm -hmm. they would still come up short. So my question is, how do you promote black prosperity in these industries that are mostly focused on being very, cent very centralized points of power um, that have typically excluded low-income people of color in, in, in favor of essentially white men? I'm going to 
take your question and bring it back over here to the challenge I got on innovation. And you said I had some, and I do, and I said keep holding around my pocket. I think with that it would be something like distributed generation. You familiar with distributed generation, right? Smaller generation in different pockets. And then the groups could get together, the smaller groups can do it. Unfortunately, the utility company is not going to let you do it. They hate distributed generation. Oh, hate it. Oh, hey, hey, all utilities hate it because it takes control away from them. So if distributed generation could do what you're talking about, hey, get some of the little knucklehead drug dealers to pull their money and put up a little generation plant. You know, get a <laughs> jet engine somewhere and feed it, you know. Yes, it's possible to do that sort of innovation, but you're not going to be able to put a wind and a solar in Detroit. But you could put distributed generation where you start chipping away at that rate increase. That 30% rate increase is a backbreaker yep. for a poor family. But distributed generation brings the control back into back into those. So that's the sort of thing we would like to push. And we have tried to push that. But we're really, really small. We, I wish we had big money like, like the Nature Conservancy. They have $6 billion a year. I'd be doing that. Thank you. Yes. Okay.
I wish we could do that. I do wish, but what's going to replace our national highway system that we invested in over the 20th century to build the uh, envy of the world? What's going to replace the internal combustion engine? What's going to replace that technology where we use 18 million barrels of oil every day? It would take just as long to back those out um, with electric vehicles. I mean, I think you back out a certain number over 10 years to back out um, uh, uh, what, 100 million vehicles. It's just tough. It's just people aren't going to run out and buy the energy. Where are you going to get the precious metals for all the batteries? It's just not out there to provide that for, let's say, 500 million vehicles, even for China, India, and the United States. So I hear what you're saying, but in the real world, it's not. It's just not. I don't see what's practical. The best we can do is is make these vehicles. And trust me, I was out there in the 80s against the Reagan administration protecting automobile fuel economy standards, corporate average fuel economy standards. That's the sort of thing we can do. That's the sort of thing I've done, so I know what you're talking about. Let's just use these resources as, as efficiently and as environmentally friendly as we can. Yes. Oh, thank you. Um, I just wanted to ask, you know, as we, you're talking about climate change, and we know that global warming climate change disproportionately affects younger and certain future generations, and we've seen this trend throughout time. And I'm just wondering, you know, you talk about the, pros the prosperity of... of um, Situating people in systems of settler colonialism and capitalism and, and growth and of capital. And um, as much as I respect your perspective in coming here, and, and I want to thank you for coming to the University of Oregon and Eugene, Oregon, to this pretty um, radically and environmentally charged conference and, and presenting your um, opinions. My question to you, though, is as young people are disproportionately feeling the effects of climate change right now, and as we know that these effects will be exacerbated <coughs> and only worsened in the future for my generation and all the younger generations to come, how are you considering the voices of the youth and the needs of the youth? Because I'm not only interested in prosperity, but posterity, and, and the very serious question of, am I going to have a, a climate system, a, a land base, a water source that I will be able to raise my family on and I as a young person will be able to live on. So I'm just wondering, in your advisory council, in your, uh, amongst your team, what are the voices of the younger generation to not continue, not talking about the future and ingraining the systems that, to be frank, I think were a mistake from the beginning, the systems that only hurt and oppress people on the planet, not continuing forward with that vision and amongst the systems that already exist, but actually listening to the needs of the young people who don't want to participate in those systems anymore. Right. My son is 27 years old, and he's going to take over for me once I'm no longer doing this. And he's been at my, I, I got full custody of him when he was two, and he has been with me. He's been out with plants and everything, everything with me. I think what we can do is educate the younger generation to the practical aspects of our situation, the practical aspects of uh, getting a, a balancing a $500,000 home mortgage and two car notes, and two kids in college with our global warming concerns. And I think part of that, let me ask the question, what is the danger of global warming? How and who is it going to hurt and when? How so? Very specifically. Potter? It's Potter, but okay. You know, it's Wait a minute, wait a minute, right here is what I'm getting to. We have two cities moving because of ocean. Yeah, right. So, okay, but let me get to the specific here. I think one of the big things is the sea level rise. Well, before that, we're all going to die because we're going to have freaking water anyway. Yeah, you laugh, but who did water security? The nation becomes ungovernable. Okay, let me let me speak. Let, 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 let me speak. No, the reason I laugh is because well, but there's plenty of water in the ocean, and you can purify water through these cells. What we're doing in California. I live in California. Believe me, I live on an island. That's how. Purify the aquifer. Not the aquifer. The ocean. We got an ocean right over there. We have an ocean, and you can you can see that. Well, let me get back to the question. One thing with young people and a practical solution is that make, start making plans for sea level rise. Amtrak along the East Coast, I mean, I've been from Washington, New York all the time. You're going to have to move it. Refineries are right down there on the coast as well. Manhattan, <clears throat> lower Manhattan, right down there. 
All of that's going to have to be replaced. That's the point I'm going to try to get to with you. Start um, with the adaptations we need to have our society where we can operate effectively and efficiently. And there are all kinds of opportunities to do that. But we can't chase pipe dreams that aren't going to work because it's going to make the situation worse. Yes, follow up. Oh, yeah, just with all due respect, I, I, I think the answer is still um, telling me as a young person, um, as someone who works with the youngest of five years old on mm -hmm. climate issues, you're still telling me to prepare for a future that is inevitable based on the need for growth in a system that functions on a system that you're, that you're kind of focused on. Mm -hmm. That is not the system that I want. It's not the system that my peers want. So I, I don't think, maybe perhaps there's not an answer, but my question would be, how can you move forward in your line of work with the amazing work that you do, thinking about actually what are not the needs of me and my peers and, and, and these older generations? What are not the needs of the past and the founding of the United States of America? But what are the interests and the needs of, of the future generations to which this economy, but also the Earth will inherit? I think in your specific situation, you should probably uh, share many of the components of the Green New Deal with the young people you're talking about. Next question. Yes, in fact. What policies do you think can most effectively promote distributed generation and the ownership of distributed generation assets by communities that have historically been the most affected by the traditional fossil fuel industry? I think maybe um, allowing for expensing of the, of the facilities. That every by, component, by, hmm? by, by the government. That is, that you can write off any expenses related to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But at least you're going to get the investment in the distributed generation. How do you feel about the companies that are offering, for example, that they will put solar panels on your home that oh. they own, but that you use to get net metering, for example? Yeah, that's tough. I mean, in a large scale. Because of the nature of solar, you can't have shadows coming over it. You got to be careful when you have outages that you have a switch that turns it off, so you don't even let your workers. That each rooftop piece is really complex. You got to have a computerized where when it's offline, you have backup, and you're going to have to have backup. What you're going to back it up with is usually going to be a fossil source. So that's a tough uh, road for the utilities, and that's why they're not really doing it. I mean, New Jersey, if you go to New Jersey, they've done it, they've done it big time there. And I think we should put photovoltaics everywhere we can and, and hook it up to the extent we can, but not to where it then compromises the integrity of the grid. Yes. Yeah, it's too bad with the government, but we keep electing the same Congress people over and over and over, and it really is Congress, right? The same thing over and over. Right, the same thing.
falar mal falou tudo, não é? Ok, mas é still government. I mean, we're still talking government. So, and that's the problem is if you have government control and operations, you said the corporations. I think it's unfair too. I absolutely think it's unfair. But I'm saying that being practical, you don't want to sacrifice your health or the health of your children to make a point. Yes. So the United States has the largest greenhouse gas emissions per capita of any nation in the world. China does? The United States, they have the largest greenhouse gas emissions per capita. Okay, yeah. We call this prosperity. Yeah, yeah. Our lifestyle, our economy, it has a lot of environmental consequences. Right.